good as or, or even better than physicians managing your anticoagulation or, or an anticoagulation clinic managing it. You will still be trained and supervised by us, and Rennell is piloting that project in the clinic here at Brigham and Women's. Now, I've taught you a little bit how you can stay stable on WARF, and I've taught you what additional steps you can take. And I, I must say, if you're going to change anything because of this um, presentation, make sure you let your WARF manager know, because that initial change, it, you're going to require probably a dose adjustment. Then after that, you'll probably be more stable than before. So if you plan on changing anything, please call in and let us know. But other ways to stay safe on this medication, you can do everything perfect with your diet and alcohol and medications, but if you're not taking your doses, if you're missing doses, or if you're doubling up your dose, you don't have any real chance at stability. When you miss a dose, you can go from a perfect level, maybe a 2.5, all the way down to a 1.5, which is almost close to someone that's not taking uh, warfarin or, or below that. Uh, it's close to not, someone not taking warfarin at all, so it's very important to, to take all your doses. And if you do miss one, call into the clinic. If it's the next morning, skip your dose, call into the clinic. We'll help you make, make up for it. It's not perfect, but we'll help. And um, use a pill box. A pill box is a great tool for this medication because if, if you put your medications in a pill box, if it's still there the next morning, you know you missed it. Or if it's not there, you know you took it and you don't double up on your medication. And we actually have a guide to taking warfarin at the uh, desk over there. And um, in the back of it is a warfarin uh, a warfarin calendar where you can actually, it's made so you can record your doses of warfarin. You can slip that right under the pill box so you record your dose. When your pill box is empty, you fill it back up with the recorded dose that you use in the calendar. It's a helpful tool, so if, if you, we don't have any more at the booth, then call into our clinic, we'll mail you one. And um, the other thing is it's important to wear a identification card or, or a, a bla bracelet saying that you're on warfarin. I think that's extremely important. If you're ever unable to speak for yourself in an emergency situation, someone needs to know you're on this medication so that uh, you, they can reverse it before they do any types of procedures in, in, the, uh, in the emergency department. It's extremely important. And we have um, something you can mail in at the anticoagulation booths and get a bracelet. You can choose exactly how you want. You can inscribe warfarin on the back. And we also have identification cards that you can just slip in your wallet uh, and someone will look there in an the emergency situation. So with that, I'll open up the floor to uh, any questions you guys have. Yes. If you have, if uh, when, right. If so, the question is, um, how long does it take? after you eat a, a green leafy vegetable meal, vitamin K meal, before you start to see a difference in your INI results. If you consistently uh, change your diet for two or three days, um, or even four days, you'll start to see, um, you'll start to see a change in your INI results within, within 24 hours if it's a big change, but mainly over about three days, you'll start to see a change in your INR. But you can see, if we gave you a, a big vitamin K tablet, we can start to see a, a result of that vitamin K within 12 12 hours. Your liver metabolizes war. Uh, the, the question again is, is uh, how long does the vitamin K actually last in your system after you do eat a meal? And uh, your liver actually breaks down vitamin K very quickly over three or four days. So that's why they use a daily vitamin of vitamin K to kind of keep your levels nice and consistent. And that's something that you do that's supervised by us. It's not something you really start on your own. But um, over, three, over about three days, you'll, you'll really start to deplete your vitamin K stores after you fill them up with a green leafy vegetable meal. That's why it may not be enough to just eat one green leafy vegetable meal a week because by the end of the week, that's depleted. You, your levels went from high to low. Uh, yes? Uh, if you forget your dose, the question is what exactly do you do? If you forget your dose and it's still the same night, go ahead and take it. No. If you forget it, right. If it's the next morning, if you woke up and it's the next morning, then you need to skip your dose and, and give us a ring. Because you don't want to take warfarin the next morning because then your next two doses will be about 12 hours apart and your levels can, can really spike. A lot of times, and it's sometimes the clinician's um, own... Uh, 
own way of doing it, but a lot of times what they'll do is they'll have you skip your dose and they'll make up for it with it by a little extra cumin in the next night. We don't ever want you to take your cumin on your own after you miss a dose in the morning. Always give us a ring. Yes? Yeah, that's a great question, and um, this, I uh, apologize if you guys have a lot of questions. I'll be available in the clinic at all times, but um, I'm, I'm not as punctual as, as, as John and, and Dr. Goldhaber. I'm running a little bit behind. Um, the question is, what if you're traveling to a different time zone, which is a great question. And what, I've, what I have done with patients is, is some time zones are very simple. China is about 12 hours, so you, instead of taking it at 8 o'clock at night, you take it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Other time zones are much more difficult, like Italy or, or Europe where you're you know, eight hours ahead and, and you'd be taking your dose at four in the morning. I'm not going to have you setting your alarm clock to taste, take your warfarin dose. What I've done in the past is I've uh, you know, kind of titrated the dose down before you, before you left. So instead of taking it at eight o'clock at night, the day, the day before you leave, you take it at seven. The day before that, you take it at six. And you kind of you get it to a manageable time. So the day before you leave, maybe you take your dose at three o'clock in the afternoon. When you're on vacation, all of a sudden, it's at 9 o'clock at night. It makes things a little bit easier. So you have to kind of plan for it in advance. Yes? Uh, the question is, uh, in regards to when should I be eating and taking my dose, or when should I be testing my blood and taking my dose, you should be able to test your blood any time of the day or night. It shouldn't depend, you know, it doesn't matter if you took your, your warfarin dose an hour before or 15 hours before. You should have roughly the same levels throughout the entire week. Um, so you should be in somewhat of a, what we call a steady state. It doesn't matter what time you take your your warfarin and test your blood. And in regards to eating, you, you can take warfarin without regard to food. You can take it with or without food. Sometimes people say that that bothers their stomach, and I say go ahead and eat with it. Make sure you eat every time you take, take it. Maybe it won't bother your stomach as, as much, but you don't have to take it with food or without food. But I gotta I got hand it over to, um, to Cheryl. Um, I'll be available out there for any questions you guys have and in the clinic also. And uh, Cheryl, Cheryl's a clinician also in the anticoagulation service. She does a great job with her patients. She has a full patient load too. And she knows these home machines inside and out. So there's no better person to hand it over to to talk to you about these home meters. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Cheryl Silva, pharmacist in the anticoagulation service, and I am here to talk to you today about home machines and home monitoring of your INR. A little bit louder? Sure. Thanks. You're welcome. Is that better? Okay. So what is home monitoring? It is taking a finger stick sample, so whole blood from your finger, on a small point of care device. Um, it's also known as patient self-testing, which Dave spoke about just a moment ago. Home testing really started back in 2002, and it's just starting to, to pick up in how many patients are testing. In 2002, they started approving home machines for high-risk mechanical heart valve patients only. And in 2005, they expanded that coverage to include the training on those machines as well as management of patients who were testing at home. And recently in, or not so recently, but April of 2008, they expanded coverage to include patients who had had either a deep vein thrombosis, or atrial fibrillation. Since then, a lot of private insurance companies have followed suit and started to um, pay for those services and allow patients to test at home for their INR. So why would we want to test our blood at home? I think many of you would want to do it for convenience. Um, it does improve your quality of life, not having to travel back and forth to the laboratory all the time. and. If you take, for example, this year, our winter has been pretty bad, and a lot of us have not been able to get out every time we're due for our test. Um, it's a great alternative for patients with poor venous access, so if you have difficulty giving blood by your vein. Your results are observed within just a few minutes. So 
you don't have to have that four or five hour turnaround of going to the laboratory and hearing from us many hours later um, and the anticipation of what those results are and, and what to do next. More frequent monitoring leads to better control of your anticoagulation. So speaking along the same lines of David, your TTRs will increase, the time within your therapeutic range. So by testing every week, you know your results, you can make minor adjustments each week and, and ensure that your results are always within that therapeutic range or at least more often than they were before. It also promotes involvement in your own health care. So patients that test at home start to learn the things that interfere with their INR and they, they know exactly what to do and then they can move on to self-management, which um, you can see Rennell Stevens about or speak to any one of the other clinicians in our group for more information on that. So who is eligible for home testing? Patients that have open communication with our clinic are usually good candidates we like to know, we like to hear from you still, even though you have the monitor at home, you would still be hearing your dosing recommendations from our clinic for the most part, um, with the exception of in-between tests, you might make some minor adjustments. Those that test their INR as scheduled and are frequently following recommendations given by our clinic, you need to be willing to test your INR more often than once a month, most of the time, because insurance pays for the supplies with testing and most of the studies that were done showing that home testing is beneficial, tested patients once a week. We do normally require you to continue testing every week or maybe every other week for as long as you have a home machine. You also need to be able to perform the test. So can you apply the droplet of blood where it needs to be applied or do you have a family member that can help you? Uh, we also want to make sure that somebody is able to view the display and enter the numbers correctly. Patients that may not be eligible um, but would warrant further discussion are those with a very high or very low hematocrit. And this could be something that's ongoing or something that's just temporary, such as after surgery, um, because it can affect the results on the home monitor. Patients with the hypercoagulable state, if you have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, some of the machines can give false readings with that. Um, so we would want to discuss that further and decide which machine, if any, is suitable for you in making sure that your results are always accurate. And patients that have frequently high INRs or their target INR range is higher, say 3.5 to 4 or 3 to 4, those patients may not ha receive all of the benefits from home testing because we might be asking them to go to the laboratory to verify their results more often. The reason for that is that home monitors are very accurate within lower target INR ranges, so 2 to 3 or 2.5 to 3.5. But as your INR increases, the accuracy of the machines is, is a little bit lower. So if you have an INR, as you can see in the picture, an INR by venipuncture, so by your vein at the laboratory is 4.5, but your machine value at home is 6.5, that's a difference of two. We wouldn't want to make uh, an adjustment on your dose if your range is 3 to 4 and your INR is really only 4.5 versus 6.5. So the higher your INR on a home machine, the, the less accurate the home machines become. We always verify that the difference in your home tests versus the laboratory tests are reproducible. So as soon as you get your machine, we make sure that each time you test, the difference is approximately the same. If you test at home and the INR is 0.5 lower than your test at the lab, then the next time you test at home, we would expect the same. So the results are very reproducible. Along those same lines, we do require that you still go to the lab. So if your INR result is high, if it's above four, 
If you have doctor's appointments, routine visits within, you know, every three to six months, we would ask that you test at the lab and at home just to confirm that the accuracy is still there in your machine. We also, like I mentioned before, have you test the first couple of times both at home and on your home monitor to make sure that the, the results are accurate. So if you're testing at home, how do you know what dose of warfarin to take? The process is going to be very similar, except that we have you do your home test rather than having your blood drawn at the laboratory. You will then report your results to the supplier of your home machine. So that could be one of many companies. We have Alir and Phillips here today that you can speak to afterwards if you have questions directly for them. Um, and they report your results to us rather than the laboratory reporting a result to us. So you do not need to call us directly with the result. We will still get it the same way that we do now. Once we have the results, we will contact you as we always do with dosing recommendations and when to test your blood next. And at the same time in the background, the supplier of your machine is also interacting with your insurance company to let them know that you're tested as prescribed by your doctor and to make sure that you're receiving supplies to replenish what you've used. So there are currently three machines available for home testing. There's the ProTime, the InRatio 2, and the Coagucheck XS. We do have demonstration meters of all three here today. Some of the differences in the machines are the amount of blood that you need to apply for a sample. So the ProTime definitely has the largest sample, um, but the blood is collected a little bit differently. The in ratio and Coagucheck XS is just one droplet of blood that's applied to a test strip. All machines will result your INR within just a few minutes. With the pro time, it's about three to five minutes, and the others is approximately one minute until you receive your INR result. Refrigeration is required for pro time. Um, however, if they are left at room temperature, they're still good for 60 days, so it's not um, urgent that you always keep them in the refrigerator. You can bring them with you. You can travel with them if needed. The other two, um, you just keep your supplies at room temperature. All three machines have a fairly large memory. They hold anywhere from 50 to 120 tests in their memory that you can go back and check your results. They are all battery operated. The ProTime offers an AC adapter. You can also plug it in if the rechargeable battery dies. The others are run on regular alkaline batteries. And the sizes vary greatly. Um, the ProTime is much larger than the other two machines. So if you're looking for something more portable, one of the others might be a better option for you. But we do have all three on demonstration here today so you can see them. One important thing to note is that only right now, only the Coagucheck excess is insensitive to therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin or heparin. So if you're somebody that's frequently on an injectable anticoagulant for bridging, that might be a better option for you so that you have reliable results during those times and don't have to travel to the laboratory. So how do you know which monitor is the right monitor for you? One way is to go ahead and look at the demonstration meters that we have here today. Touch the buttons, look at them, see what features they have that you like and, and dislike. You can contact your warfarin manager so you can speak to um, whoever your primary clinician is or you can speak to myself. I would be happy to talk to you about each of the meters and, and what they offer. You can also speak with the representatives from Alir and Phillips who are here today. They can go through the, the meters with you. And the last option would be to contact other patients that test at home. Uh, we do have several patients that test at home already and would be happy to share their experiences with you and let you know how it's going with the machine that they have. The process for getting a home monitor 
once you decide this is something that you would like to pursue, you want to talk to your primary clinician within the anticoagulation management service. We can make sure that you are a suitable candidate for home testing. We will then have our physician or nurse practitioner within the clinic order the meter for you. They would write a prescription for the, the meter and for all of its supplies. That information is turned over to the supplier and they can disclose any costs that would be required of you in order to test at home. You do not have any obligation to go through with getting the monitor if you go through that initial verification of your insurance. So we can do that and see what the cost would be to you before deciding if you want to do it. Once you've given the approval that yes, this is something that you still want to go through with and you can uh, afford the cost to you, the monitor would be delivered to your trainer or to our clinic. And that entire process generally takes about four to six weeks. Once the monitor is received, we would either bring you back into our office to learn how to use the monitor and make sure that you are able to perform your first test on your own. And if you decide not to come in to Brigham and Women's to meet with your clinician, we can arrange for a trainer to come to you and do the training in your home. So what does the future of home testing bring? So some of you might already have a home monitor. If you do, um, some of the machines that are already available are trying to incorporate new technology where you wouldn't need to call in your results. You would be able to just automatically transmit them to the company and in turn to Brigham and Women's. We also have this new patient self-management going on where we can teach you how to make your own adjustments to your warfarin. I have flyers and Rennell Stevens has flyers and we'd also be happy to talk to you about those opportunities after the program. Does anybody have any questions about home monitoring? Thank you. Yes. So the, the question is, what is the average cost to the patient? And that really depends on what your insurance is. Insurance companies generally will cover about 80% of the cost. Some of them will cover the entire cost. A machine out of pocket goes for probably between $2,000 and $2,500. But that the insurance usually picks up most of that cost. It is a rent. If, if your insurance allows for you to purchase the machine, then that would be the cost. Most of the insurance companies do loan them. So for as long as you need to test with it, it's on lease to you. If you no longer need to test at home or you no longer need warfarin, you ship the machine back to the supplier and it, it is no longer yours. Um, the testing supplies, if covered by insurance and at 20% of your cost, it's about $8 per test. Sometimes if you have a secondary insurance, they'll pick up the remainder of that. Yes? If you have problems, you know, staying in a range even weekly, you're low and you're high, will the machine still be all right for you to use? Or does that make it more difficult? So the question is if your INRs are out of range a lot and constantly fluctuating is the, is the home machine a good option? And I think yes, it can help us to, if you're testing more often, even if you're already testing at the laboratory every week, it could be supplemental tests that you're doing so that maybe every one of those tests isn't at the lab or maybe you're testing two times per week but once at the lab and once at home. And we can really get a handle on what those changes are that are, are making your INR fluctuate. Yes? Yes? Is, is the home testing machine good for sugar too? And unfortunately, they are completely different tests and different machines. Yes? Do you have two people in the same household using water? Do they use the same machine? 
if you have two people in the same household on warfarin, can they use the same machine? The answer to that is no. Um, the machines that you use at home are licensed to one user. The machines that they use in doctor's offices to do home tests are built a little bit differently and allow for multiple blood samples to go into the same machine. Yes. Yes. So what is the advantage to the larger ProTime machine? There are advantages to that machine. Um, the results are very accurate. It has been around a little bit longer. Um, the patients with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which I talked about, um, the results are more accurate on that machine versus the other ones, and it won't give a false reading, a false elevated reading. So. Uh, there, there are advantages that has its place, and we have patients that have been using it for years and really do like it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So, you mentioned in your presentation that people can have a high hematocrit mm -hmm. and are a good candidate for the machine. What do you consider high? What is considered a high hematocrit for testing at home? Um, the cutoffs are usually very high, so over 55. Um, Right. It, it would be something that you're aware of that you run constantly high. And that's the same for testing at a laboratory. If you run a really high hematocrit, you need a special adjusted tube in order to do an INR test. And this machine doesn't have that capability. Yes? How low, how low is the hematocrit that you cannot use the machine? How low is the hematocrit that you cannot use the machine? So it varies by machine. And we could look up the specifics for you depending on which machine you're looking at. If it's something that's transient around surgery, then it may be that during that, that small time frame, you're not able to use the home machine. But later on, once it recovers, you could go back to home testing. How do you determine which of the three machines are best for you? I think that really involves uh, looking at the machines, looking at each one's features and discussing it with your clinician. So if you have certain things that you're looking for, if you definitely want to travel with it, if you definitely want to be able to test in a, in a certain environment, if you prefer to do a droplet of blood from the top of the machine versus the side, there are different options there. So you really want to take a look at them and discuss it and find out which one would be right for you. They are all very good machines. They all have their, their benefits. And I think that um, certain ones are definitely better for certain patients. But there would be no way to know what the prices are. The, the, prices, the prices are similar. OK. okay? The, there's not a huge difference in price. The Coagutech XS tends to be a little bit more expensive in terms of strips. But it's it's very small difference. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ruth Morrison and Catherine Mickelson. Uh, the discussion is about pulmonary embolism and DVT support groups. All okay. yours. So going forward, uh, just press uh, this to go forward. <laughs> yep. Okay. And then we had a laser pointer here somewhere, but you can. I don't need the laser. Yeah, okay. Okay. All okay. Yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to thank the Anticoagulation Service for inviting us here today. Did I do that? Okay, thanks. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh my God. Anyway, um, inviting us here today, uh, this is a very exciting project for us. Um, we've run a pulmonary embolism support group at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and now we actually have a project that we're nationalizing it, and we're going to tell you all about it. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the incidence of DVT and or pulmonary embolism is actually one uh, to two per um, thousand adults per year in the United States alone. And I know that mentioned that earlier today. The U.S. Surgeon General estimates that there are 100,000 to 180,000 fatal pulmonary uh, embolism cases annually. Survivors of DVT or pulmonary embolism may suffer from physical as well as most emotional challenges. And uh, there are more people who die each year from complications of DVT, AIDS, breast cancer, and car accidents all combined. 
Just to review some of the physical limitations, patients suffer from chronic venous insufficiency or post-robotic syndrome. They often can have pain, swelling, and tenderness. Some patients actually suffer from chest pain or shortness of breath, and some patients are actually uh, diagnosed um, with a devastating disease of pulmonary hypertension. And as we know from our support group, many of the patients suffer from emotional challenges, stress, anxiety, uh, depression. Many of our patients have returned to the emergency room experiencing panic attacks, not realizing that uh, it's not another pulmonary embolism, uh, fear of the unknown, and they often suffer from financial hardships. And <laughs> at this time, I just want to take a moment to thank Catherine Mickelson for doing our slides today. She's done, a, she's done a wonderful job. She's totally responsible for the school slide set, and she's done a beautiful job. I am not responsible for that picture of Dr. Goldtaber, and I am personally not responsible for those curls. So that's it. <laughs> so in February of... Um, Anyway, 18 years ago, Dr. Goldtaber and I, we started the um, Pulmonary Embolism Support Group. We now have over 160 members, some of them, many of them are here, here, all my buddies. Um, and we meet uh, once every four to six weeks. Uh, originally, we met every third Wednesday evening for years, but the group decided it would be better to have a physician and a nurse uh, or one of us than run the group alone, and that's where... Um, it's come to. A typical meeting for us, we start at 7 o'clock um, sharp. It adjourns at 8.15. Members introduce themselves and share their story, and that's only if they're comfortable in doing so. Catherine has actually arranged for many guest speakers, which uh, the patients have enjoyed, physical therapists, pharmacists, and a nutritionist. And after those um, speakers, we often have a question and answer period. And something about our members, we actually did a little survey and found out that at the average age is 59. The majority have experienced one pulmonary embolism and or DVT. The majority of um, them have experienced their first PE and DVT over five years ago. And I think this says a tremendous um, thing about our group, that our group members have stayed for such a long period of time and they don't come back for support for themselves. They actually come back to support the newbies or the patients that have been recently d diagnosed, and so we've always really appreciated that. And the most common emotional side effects, which many will um, have, are anxiety and frustration. Uh, what um, our PE group members, we have hundreds of um, things that they've uh, talked to us in emails and whatnot, but we took just a few of them. Um, patients love to learn, and they love to learn about the disease and that others have the same problems. Uh, that there is help and support close by. They love the information. For instance, I learned about home testing that Cheryl talked about, and now that instead of going to the doc I can do it at home instead of going to the doctor's office. Knowing that life goes on pretty much as before for the vast majority of patients with only minimal um, daily inconveniences. And some of them uh, like hearing about the current status of research in this area, and Dr. Goldtaber is always uh, very willing at meetings to give them the update and what's new, and they definitely enjoy that. Um, some say it's extremely beneficial for them to hear that others had similar fears that they had, and just being able to express their fears and feelings to others was a tremendous um, help to them. And now I'm going to turn this over to Catherine, and she's going to tell you the benefits of the support group and how we're doing in our project so far. Hi, I'm Catherine Mickelson, um, and I work at the Brigham. I'm Dr. Goldhaber's administrative coordinator. Um, so, and just to piggyback on what Ruth said about our group, our next meeting is March 23rd at 7 p.m., and it's in the Duncan Reed Conference Room, which is just right down this hall on the left. Um, so we hope some of you will be able to join us. Um, so given the success of the support group that Dr. Goldhaber and Ruth started here 18 years ago, uh, just side note, I was only 10 then, so um, <laughs> just to mention. <laughs> um, so <laughs> What brought that? 
I didn't tell you about that oh, remark, did I? <laughs> um, so the support groups, they, they have a lot of benefits for the patients. Um, they allow them to share their experiences, um, cope with the challenges they face, increase knowledge, increase confidence, gain support, um, learn up-to-date, and what I think most importantly is accurate information. There's a lot of bad information out there. I know I'm guilty of it, too, going online and Googling symptoms and stuff, um, and it always ends with you're going to die immediately. So this gives some good information. Um, the objective of starting support groups is to start them throughout the United States and Canada. Um, the groups will focus on the unmet educational needs of the patients diagnosed with a DVT or PE, and they will foster um, patient education, awareness, and advocacy among the patients and the healthcare professionals who are involved. Um, our goals are to educate the healthcare providers on communication skills that will allow them to better counsel and educate their patients, um, develop a support group blog, which will actually be on the NETF website. They'll be giving the presentation after ours, um, which will allow the hospitals and the patients to connect. Um, we're going to employ a five-phase evaluation plan so we can basically see how successful we're being at um, starting these support groups and whether or not we're meeting the goal of helping the patients. Um, and finally, we're going to publish a document on how to successfully create and maintain a support group. For every site that signs up with us, we are going to provide them with educational tools that we're putting together. Um, this will include a facilitator's guide, pamphlets to promote the support group to their patients, a blog on the NATF website, a monthly newsletter, which will be an e-letter, teleconferences that we're going to host periodically with the hospitals that are starting the PE support groups, um, as well as access to Dr. Goldhaber and Ruth, who have run a successful support group for so long. Um, so just a side note, the, the time that the MDs and the nurses and the administrative support put into this is purely volunteer. Um, it is minimal, but, you know, everybody is so busy these days that it is um, – you know, wonderful that people have found the time to add this to their list of things. Um, for the MD, we anticipate it'll take about one hour per four to six weeks. This is basically attending the meetings and being there as a resource for the patients. Um, nurses, the same one hour for every four to six weeks to attend meetings. Um, one of the main functions of the MDs and the nurses is going to be recruiting patients during their clinic. Um, so if a patient comes in who's been newly diagnosed with a DVT or PE, um, to hand them a pamphlet and tell them a little bit about our group. And then the administrative support, uh, which is what I do, is I attend the meetings, um, I reserve the meeting space, and then I also send out evites for every meeting, as well as booking a guest speaker if um, we decide to have one that month. And she's so young, she can do all that in such a short time. Just period. like that. <laughs> Um, so how are we doing? We're still in the preliminary stages, but we're really excited. We have seven individuals in Canada or who are interested in starting support groups at their hospitals. We have 22 throughout the United States, um, and we hope to have the first meeting scheduled to begin in May 2011, and that will probably take place at one of our sites in Canada. Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions? Yes. So the question was, do we have access to um, like psych psychiatric nurses or clinical social workers? And we do have access to those. Those are one of the um, people that's actually on our list of upcoming speakers at a support group is to get somebody to come to talk about dealing with the emotional effects. So and we do have that access, yes. Oh, sorry. And actually, given the very beginning of the PE support group, when we very first started, Dr. Goldhaber and myself, we felt a little inept in the psychological feely, feely stuff, and um, we ended up having a psychiatrist come, and the, it worked out for a very short period of time, but then the patients actually didn't enjoy it because they didn't feel that they actually needed a psychiatrist. They needed the support from the other group members. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it was it, that part of it left, so, well, but we stayed there. So, um, I'll introduce Carolyn Kernan and Al Howe come from the North American Thrombosis Forum. Um, the founding uh, father of that organization is here, Dr. Goldhaber, uh, Atsa Sahara, and others uh, from around the country. You're, you're welcome. Yes, I, uh, yes, I sometimes forget that. So yes, I am uh, indeed one of them. Um, and they're going to talk to you a little bit about their efforts uh, in terms of uh, public awareness uh, and interventions.
Thank you, John, and thank you to the anti coag service for hosting this program today and to all of you for being in attendance. My name is Caroline Kernan. This is El Howe, and we're going to talk about how the North American Thrombosis Forum is fighting blood clots and saving lives through education and prevention. Uh, as John Finico has already said, our board of directors is made up of the anti coag's very own Dr. Goldhaber, John Funikos, as well as our other founding board members, Dr. Sasahara, uh, Dr. Jawad Farid, and Dr. Janine Walenga, and Dr. Greg Piazza. We were founded in 2006, so we're coming up on our fifth birthday this May. We're very proud of that fact. And our many uh, committees work together to um, develop NATF's educational programs, our public policy initiatives, and advocacy. Our mission is to focus on unmet needs and issues related to thrombosis and cardiovascular diseases, such as deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction, peripheral arterial occlusive disease, and stroke. Our vision is to improve patient care outcomes and public health by utilizing a multidisciplinary approach to advance thrombosis research and education. And I've emphasized multidisciplinary because this is an aspect of the organization that we're particularly proud of. Our members encompass scientific researchers, including um, industry representatives, healthcare providers, including physicians, pharmacists, and nurses, government offices, and policymakers, and of course, most importantly, you, the patients. So so we see our role really as to bring these many different groups together um, to facilitate communication and collaboration and allow a more broad-based and inclusive approach to healthcare. And similarly, we facilitate communication between uh, the different medical specialties, such as cardiologists, neurologists, orthopedic surgeons, emergency medicine, and with the ultimate goal of um, bettering patient care in terms of diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of thrombosis. Our five areas of focus are education and prevention, public policy, advocacy, basic translational research, and clinical research, especially diagnosis and therapy. So as NETF's event coordinator, I'm heavily involved with the planning of our educational programs. And I know Dr. Goldhaber has told you about our two coming up in April. On April 28th, from 4 to 9 p.m., we have our thrombosis prevention forum entitled Atrial Fibrillation Management in 2011, a new state of the art. And this is just across the street on Avenue Louis Pasteur. And I hope you all will join. It's very um, patient-focused. We have a panel discussion that includes um, both healthcare providers and patients. There's question and answer sessions after every presentation, um, and it's a very good opportunity for you to interact with the health care providers who are providing your care. On April 29th, we have the Hospital DVT Prophylaxis Strategies Meeting, which is less patient-focused, but if you're interested in finding out how hospitals around the country are preventing DVT in the hospital patient population, we encourage you to attend that program as well. In the fall, we have our thrombosis working group session where our committees come together as well as industry representatives to create a working plan for NATF in the coming year. And then on Saturday, uh, September 24th of this year, we have our thrombosis summit at the Fairmont Copley Plaza Hotel. And this is another um, patient-focused program, uh, panel discussions, question and answer. And if you um, take our contact card before you leave and email me your contact information. I will certainly get in touch with all of you about signing up for this program when we begin registration. So NATF has seen a lot of advancements in thrombosis awareness since its inception. In um, 2007, uh, Massachusetts announced that November was Thrombosis Awareness Month. In 2008, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services declared that hospital DVT and PE um, are never events, meaning they're preventable medical errors. And also in 2008, 